my watch says it is 11 o'clock. So happy 100th anniversary of Armistice. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I was 25 years old the first time I went to the hospital as a pastor. Actually, I was just an intern, and so I wore my clergy shirt hoping to look the part even if I didn't feel it. Walking through the automatic doors of the front entrance, I felt very much out of place. And then in the elevator, a nurse called me Father, and I felt worse. I tried to calm myself down as I walked into the hospital room. A 16-year-old girl from our congregation had had surgery. It was an appendectomy or some sort of surgery like that. Her mom stepped out of the room for some coffee, so it was just the two of us. How are you feeling? I asked. Oh, I'm fine, she said. Hey, do you want to see my scar? She began to move her hospital gown aside. In a flash, I imagined meetings with the bishop about inappropriate conduct with a minor, <laughs> newspaper headlines. I imagined my career finishing before it ever began. No, I said quickly, and then tried to recover. Uh, no, no, it's, it's okay. I don't need to see it. Her mom returned. I muddled through a prayer of thanksgiving for healing and got the heck out of there. <laughs> that prayer turned out to be the easiest part of my hardest hospital visit but it's often the other way around. Often the visit is delightful, but the prayer can be hard. Because often it isn't a prayer of thanksgiving, it's a prayer asking for healing. A healing we know is often unlikely. I remember praying with an old man who had undergone every imagined treatment for what ailed him, but they hadn't been successful. We prayed and prayed for healing, but it never came. And I confess towards the end, my prayers or for comfort and peace, not healing. If you're like me, talk of healing can be a little bit uncomfortable even. I, I, believe, rather, I believe strongly that God works through doctors and nurses and therapists and even the rare miracle to heal. But this thing we call life is terminal. And so eventually our prayers for healing will fail. And if you're like me, this very fact can make the idea of divine healing hard to swallow. Today's story about Elisha and Naaman is a story of healing, but I don't think it's a story of a healing. Rather, there are a few, and it may just be the story we need in order to rescue the idea of healing for us, the story we need to give us new imagination as we wonder together, what does healing look like? The story takes place in a time when the little northern kingdom of Israel was constantly at odds with its neighbors, even war, especially with one called Aram. In one battle, the Aram army took some prisoners and made them slaves, as they were known to do. And one of these slaves was a young girl, and she's the first person who comes on the scene in our story. And I wonder, what might healing look like for her? Physically, she's fine, as far as we know, but of course she is not fine. A girl taken from her family and people and forced into slavery is never fine. At best, she was treated well, though always an outcast. And at worst, well, we don't want to think about that. In any event, she wasn't home and she wasn't free. Her master is married to the commander of the army, a successful and important man, who is also very sick with one of the many skin diseases the Bible calls leprosy. So the young slave makes an unusual decision. She tells her master about a man back home in Israel who is more powerful than any here, a man who could surely heal you. It's a dangerous thing for a slave to do, brag about home. But it's also a merciful thing to do. She didn't have to care for this man. She didn't have to open her mouth. The secret divine presence in Israel could have remained a secret. Let the slave keep her suffer. But she shares the secret. She is merciful. And it would be too much, I suppose, to say this is healing for her. But it may be a taste of healing. Trapped in slavery, this girl has no agency. But in this act of mercy, she grabs a little. In this act of mercy, she makes a decision. She determines the course of action. She breaks down just a little the barrier between her and her captors by her own choice. She isn't free by any stretch of the imagination, and freedom is the only real healing for her. But in a making a choice of mercy, she has a taste of freedom. I wonder if that's what freedom, if, I wonder if that's what healing looks like.
for her. Naaman, the commander of the victorious army, is desperate, so he listens to this slave girl. He approaches his king, who sends Naaman with gifts beyond measure and a whole slew of servants to Israel, to the king of Israel, with hope that he will cure Naaman. But the king of Israel does, is not happy to see this caravan enter his country. I wonder what healing might look like for the king of Israel. Here is a man in a tough spot. He is charged with leading this small nation. More than that, he is charged with maintaining a truth among his people that they are a chosen people, that God has an eye out especially for them, that God will keep them and hold them and call them to greatness. But that's kind of hard to do when you keep losing battles. It's hard to tell your people they are chosen by God when you are beaten and broken over and over. Shoot, in this story, it even says that God gave victory to Aram. How does that make the king of Israel feel? Does he even believe they are chosen anymore? Does he have faith? And now he's got Naaman on his doorstep with the expectation of a miracle. The king tears his clothes in despair. He feels taunted by the more successful king of Aram. He feels trapped between his nation's reputation and his low success rate. And he certainly doesn't feel like he's capable of any of this. Cure leprosy. Yeah, right. What would healing look like for the king? Elisha, he hears of the king's despair and sends a message. Don't worry, he says. I'll send Naaman on over here. I'll cure him. There is a prophet in Israel. God still speaks through us. And right there, there is healing. Israel will not become the great nation the king envisions. In fact, in a hundred or so years, it'll be destroyed. But there is still healing here. The king recovers some of that lost faith, and maybe the people do too. There is a prophet in the land. God has not disappeared. God still speaks through us. Faith is restored. I wonder if this is what healing looks like for the king and people of Israel. Naaman makes his way to Elisha's house, and he is healed. Healed like in the normal way you think of the word. He's cured of his leprosy, restored to the image of the strong man. But there is more, more healing A healing Naaman didn't even know he needed. A healing he didn't want. Naaman was an important man. But Elisha doesn't seem to care about that. He doesn't even go out and see Naaman. He just sends someone from the house out to meet him in the driveway and tell him to wash. It would be like going to the hospital and being treated by the guy who parks your car. Worse, he isn't even told to wash in some great river, but in the Jordan, which is like a creek. So Naaman, the important, victorious man, followed the second-hand word of a foreign prophet, stripped his clothes, and in front of his slaves and the people of Israel, bathed in a creek that was barely chest deep. His leprosy on full display. It was humiliating. So much so that he almost didn't do it. The servants told him to give it a try, since it isn't that hard. But this is probably the hardest thing Naaman ever did. And in that, I think there is healing. For even as Naaman is restored to the image of the strong man, here he is also restored to the image of a man, just another person. Brought low by Elisha, he is no more nor less important than anyone else. His inflated pride takes a beating in this story, which it needed. And so I think there just might be healing here. What does healing look like? If we limit ourselves to the idea that healing is only a mending of a broken body, a physical wellness, then not only will we see only one instance of healing in this story, but we'll also consider all forms of healing as inadequate because, you know, mortality. But God is bigger than that, and so is God's healing. God gave a taste of healing to a young girl enslaved to her captors by giving her a taste of agency, a taste of freedom. God healed the king of Israel by giving him faith again. God healed an important commander of his physical disease, and God healed him of the prideful image he had of himself. Healing is when something broken is mended. Whether the brokenness is freedom, faith, body, or pride, Healing is when God takes something and brings it closer to the image God has for it. It's when something becomes the way it should be. So what does healing look like? Too broad a question. 
What does healing look like for you? Well, that's more interesting. You'll be invited forward today to receive anointing with oil and a prayer for healing. What brokenness in life might you ask God to mend? What freedom restored or tasted? What faith emboldened? What ailment relieved? What image of self or world reimagined? What does healing look like for you? I prayed once with a sick man who had tried every form of treatment imaginable, but it didn't work. He was likely going to die. We prayed for comfort and peace and even for healing. After all, who knows? Besides, healing is what everyone wanted, and it's best to be honest with God. Later that week, the man's son came to visit. The two hadn't spoken in years, one of those fights that seemed so important at the time but so small in retrospect. Still, pride kept them apart. But the son came to the hospital. The relationship mended at least a little bit. The man died not long afterwards, but he died healed. Whatever healing looks like for you today, I pray that the God of Elisha, the God of Naaman, the God of the King of Israel, the God of the slave girl of Aram, I pray that God will heal and mend what is broken. Amen. Let's stand.